because I think I missed a document. <laughs> I'll for um, it's Nate's email to us February fourteenth at okay. two p.m. Okay, sorry I missed that one. <laughs> That's all right. Emails are easy to overlook, you know, and they come in. Uh, they come in warp speed. It's like oh. yeah, right, right. <laughs> Thank you so much for all your help, Nate. <laughs> Okay, um, so it's 6.34 p.m. Um, so I read the preamble first, Nate. I think we wait a minute. Uh, the public's just joining and we have, okay. we have to wait a minute anyway. It's just okay. the time was posted at 6.35. Oh, okay, okay, all right. Yeah, we've got seven attendees. I'm assuming we'd have more, but so, like, and I don't mind if we wait just another minute, just we started it, we started the webinar a little, a minute okay. or two late. So okay. Um, can I just open the um the meeting? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. As opposed to the hearing. Okay. okay. So yeah. um so opening uh I'm opening the meeting at 6 35 p.m. Uh pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020, order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. GLCA 30A section 18 and pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021 and extended by chapter 2022 of the acts of 22 and extended again by the state legislature on July 14, 2022 and signed into law on July 16th, 2022. This public hearing and public meeting of the town of Amherst historical commission is being conducted via remote participation. Members of the public who wish to access this meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. A hyperlink to the hearing will be posted or is posted on the town's online calendar. Um, and so should we go forward to open the first hearing now? Um, I'm assuming I read the additional preambles and then open the meeting. Is that correct, Nate? Yeah, I think so. It's 636. There's, um, just made you co-host, Robin. Um, there's nine members of the public in attendance right now. Okay. I think we could start 637. Okay. Um, so in accordance with the provisions of MGL chapter 40A and article 3.60 of Amherst general bylaws, preservation of historically significant buildings, uh, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to the parties of interest. The Amherst commission is holding this public hearing to provide an opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding the following demolition application uh, requests. Uh, the first hearing before us in our agenda is 815 Main Street, uh, coal construction, a request to demolish circa 1830 single family home um, on property and any attached structures. And then could you uh, maybe just open the second one as well, Robin? I know I, I'm assuming more um, public might be here for the next one. And so I don't know if we'd want to flip the order just to. Oh, OK. OK. And also opening uh, the hearing for 98 Fearing Street, full construction request to demolish a circa 1927 detached garage. All right, Ted, I'm going to um, promote you to panelists. I know you're here. Let me know if there's anyone else who would want to help present. Hello. I don't know if the owners uh, are here or not. Um, I guess if the, yeah, they, the owners are here for 98 Fearing, you could raise your hand. Lorenzo, I've, you're allowed to talk. I don't know if you are representing the owner or are the owner or. Is the owner. Yeah. Yes. All right. I'm going to promote you to panelists then as well. And then um, you can rejoin in a, minute, a second or two. All right. Hello. Hi. Hello. All right, so I don't know who would like to start the presentation about the, we'll start with 98 Fearing. 
Uh, well, there's not much of a presentation. Uh, I think that the, the materials that we submitted speak for themselves. Um, I both, well, let's just take them one at a time. 98 fairing I described in the application as a derelict garage. Um, I, I want to address the word derelict because it caused a little bit of consternation in a member of the uh, local historic district commission the other day. And I just, for the sake of uh, clarity, I, I uh, would like to read the definition that, uh, uh, <laughs> the reason that I use the word derelict, um, and it's an adjective according to Oxford Dictionary that uh, describes land or buildings not used or cared for and in bad condition. And I think that that describes both of these properties, um, both the building at, that we're requesting to demolish at 98 Fairing and the entire uh, building on 815 Main Street. Um, there is a proposal that has been made to build uh, additional units, dwelling units on uh, 98 Fairing and that material, uh, and they did, did you attach the material, the new material from the local historic district commission presentation to these to the application for 98 fairing here? No, um, you know, they had the original one just showing that the garage would be removed to make way for parking. And so I can bring up the other ones, but I don't know how, you know, I think. No, I, that, yeah, I, I was just I was curious just whether or not, you know, the, the commission had seen it at all. Um, but um, the garage, I'm not even sure it should be called a garage. Uh, uh, Nate asked me today for some interior photographs, which I, I rushed out and took. And in, in taking those photographs, uh, it, I remembered that the floor of that building is a wood floor framed practically on directly on the ground. I'm not sure it was ever a garage. I think it was more of some kind of storage shed or um, something else. It has garage-like doors on it, but I, I don't think it was ever a garage. Maybe it was a carriage house at some point, but if it was 1927, that's not likely either. Um, right now, it, it's uninhabitable. Uh, I, I think that if I had asked Rob Moore to come out and, and, and inspect it, which you know may have been a wise thing to have done, I think he would declare it uninhabitable. Uh, it's structurally rickety. It's it's framed directly on the ground. Um, you can see through the structure to the outside. Um, it, it's, it's not. It looks decent from the outside. One of the commissioners from the local historic district commission, um, you know, said that he thought it looked pretty good. And it does. I think it from the outside it does because it's been painted and maintained on the outside. But the inside is is barely um, structurally stable. I mean, I walked up on the second floor today and I quickly decided I didn't want to be up there for very long because I was afraid it wasn't going to support me. Um, so the owners wanted to, want to demolish the, uh, the structure to make room um, to build some more housing there. And it's pretty straightforward application. I don't think there's much else to say unless Lorenzo has something to add. I think I'm going to share my screen. I'm just going to walk through the the images, both the ones that were, you know, uh, exterior shots and then also interior. So just for everyone to see. So here's uh, that is that visible for everyone? Yes. Uh, so here's that, you know, exterior facing the street. Here's the, the side. Uh, can I just go back to that one? They decided to lean to the left. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, I forget how many, there's probably like, there's 24 images, I think. So I'm just going to try to you know, spend a, a second or two on each. Um, another exterior shot. Another one. Uh, it is low to the ground, so there's a detail, though. You can see that it is framed right on the ground. Um, the back corner. Another side. Another one. And so here are some interior shots just for everyone to see some images. It's looking through the floor. And seeing seeing daylight coming in. Uh, that's, that's- Oh yeah, you not... know what? Sorry, you know, I, I um, sorry. I downloaded, <laughs> I downloaded, uh, you know, 
all the images at once. So ignore all this. This is a 15 main. No, no, that one. No, no, go back, go back. Back, let's see. Oh, no, no, correct. No, you're right, that's a 15, my bad. Yeah, so here's the exterior. This is just a detail showing the, um, the garage on the outside. Here's the roof, interior of the roof. Two by fours on two foot centers. Yeah, but those look like two true two by fours, right? I mean, they're not, it's not. Um, yeah, no, it was yeah. framed with like dimensional lumber back in the day. Yeah. And there's another detail of the side. Here's the second floor. That's the framing of the second floor. And here's the underneath the structure. All right, I guess that's it. So uh, there's only 14 images. <laughs> yeah. And then um, I'm going to do one more share. You know, so the house, the house and um, and garage were built probably roughly the same time. So what we do have is, um, you know, the application. We have a Sanborn map that shows the property with additional outbuilding. Uh, the property is right here from the 19. This is 1930. So there was. You know the house, and then what? Well, assuming is the same structure and another outbuilding. Um, you know the the prod the property has been inventory, so it's noted that the property is a craftsman style house, uh, somewhat um, unique for this area in town, and the garage kind of mimics that style. Uh, here are the plans for the property, and just quickly the um, you know this has this could change. Uh, but the idea was to the garage is located here and the idea is to remove it to make way for a proposed development so um you know the rest of it i guess if the commission has questions about these plans that were online i don't think they're as relevant to um right now to the discussion but you know we know that the owner is planning something and wants the garage removed Robin, you're muted. I don't know if you. Thank you. Uh, any other information from staff, Nate? Or should we um, move to questions for commission members? Yeah, Robin did submit. Um, it was uploaded online today, Ted, a, a report actually about the American garage from the, you know, early 20th century. Um, it's you know a document that's describes. I mean, we. I don't want to go through it all. It's 37 pages or so, but. Um, you know, that does talk to the significance of these structures and the importance of them in, in terms of the culture and the both social and architectural of, you know, that evolution. Um, I think that's it. I mean, I, you know, I feel like the images and the application, everything I just went through and Ted's um, information described it all. Okay. Um, do we have questions from the commission members before we move to public comment? Madeline? I have a question. Um, this is a simple question. Is this building, is the house on this property um, in the historic district, the National Register Historic District? And it's contributing, correct? Right. Okay. It's in both, the, is it in both the National Register and the local historic district? I know it's in the local historic district. Actually, right? now that you're saying the national, I might actually not be in the National Register. I'm looking right now. I'm just looking at our standards for designation. <laughs> right, and so, so, so yeah, so I, so staff made the designation as the, um, of significance, um, you know, there's like three kind of broad categories of why something could be significant. And, right. and so, yeah, no, it's actually outside the National Register District. It, uh, it the National Register District abuts this property, but doesn't include it. Right, uh, Pat, you have a question? So the house is listed on Macris and it's part of the local historic district. Right. So, um, that's so one would assume that the garage is, you know, part of that parcel mm -hmm. at the same, same era as the house. And so we should consider it from that perspective. Right. Any other questions from commissioners? Okay, um, so if there are no more questions from commissioners, um, we will move to uh, public 
testimony. Um, a reminder to everyone who uh, is intending to speak, um, please, for the record, uh, tell us your name and address before you begin your public comments. And um, I just wanted to give a general reminder to the commission and to members of the public that the Historical Commission's um, evaluation of this uh, this particular building for um, demolition or demolition delay is related to its historic significance. Factors around any projects uh, that might come post demolition are not part of our deliberating process. So we'd ask that you refrain from making comments regarding any project that might uh, come after this or any um, absence of uh, material, it is related just to this, the, the, the historic resource in question, which is in the garage and its significance to the neighborhood and its contribute, contribution to the public good. So with that, um, Nate, do you wanna just handle uh, letting people into public comment? I see Paige Wilder sure. is- Sure. Okay. Yeah, so if anyone wants to raise their hand, we can call you in order. So it looks like Paige, you have your hand raised and you can speak. Hi, I'm Paige Wilder. I'm at 73 Fearing Street. Um, I first want to start by welcoming you to our neighborhood. It's one of the oldest and most stable neighborhoods in Amherst. Many people have lived there 30 plus years. And when I moved here, there were four people on the street that had been here 50 plus years. Um, having seen the interior of the garage, I'm even more convinced that it's a structure that's worth saving. Uh, my garage was very similar with the upstairs portion and in the same state of not the same state of disrepair but um, one side was sunken into the ground a foot and a half we raised the building and poured a foundation and restored it it looks great um, we're not quite finished and I think that's the level that this should be held to in this neighborhood another neighbor built a new garage that looks like it's been there 100 years at 30 Fearing. It's an excellent example of what should be done in this neighborhood. Um, I understand your comment about not bringing up the project, except that I think the only reason this owner wants to take the garage down is because of the project, and the project is likely to fail. So it seems like a cart before the horse thing. So I'm requesting a, that you impose a one-year delay, demo delay, until some of this other stuff gets worked out. And I appreciate your taking the time to listen to public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, if anyone else in uh, the public attendance would like to make a comment, please raise your hand. I see Jennifer Cobb um, has raised her hand. You want to let her in? Right. Right, Jennifer, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for letting me speak. I'll be very brief. I just wanted to really echo what Paige just said. Oh, I'm Jennifer Tao. We live at 259 Lincoln Avenue. And um, I did want to, you know, just add that it that the house and the garage, you know, really go, you know, well together. They're of a piece. And um, because of where this property sits, um, almost at the corner of Lincoln and Fearing, that it's the garage and the house are visible, you know, from the public way on Fearing and very much on on Lincoln. So, um, you know, people in, enjoy it from, you know, walking down two major streets. And, you know, it just, you know, I would say that any structure that's almost 100 years old, you know, probably needs a little, you know, uh, love and maybe, you know, some, some more upkeep, but it certainly is a structure that, you know, is worth saving. I guess I would just say that, you know, any most structures in the local historic district and you know old houses throughout Amherst um, are not in the condition that they were when they were built. But if um, if they were all allowed to come down because they were in the condition that this uh, garage seems to be, I think we would lose a lot of our history. Um, and then I would echo Paige about um, you know requesting the year demolition delay because. Um, you know, there's a lot going on with the property and, you know, it's not maybe clear that it, you know, can't, that it needs to come down and it can't, couldn't be saved and preserved. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Melissa Ferris, can you let her in? Thank you. Hey, this is actually Graham Caldwell. Um, I'm her husband. We're together. Um, uh, 
Uh, we're at 285 Lincoln Avenue. We're one of the abutting neighbors. Um, and yeah, I, I similarly um, feel like that parcel is, it's more interesting to me with the garage and the, the, the house in a kind of similar style. And the fact that it's a garage that was, it's not like a normal construction, like with a slab foundation and, you know, has like weird doors on it that are from some other era. It seems like architecturally interesting and, and worth considering and saving. And I would also like to echo the thing about delaying demolition for a year until other things get worked out, especially for us, because uh, we have outbuildings that are right next to that garage. So if it's demolished, it will very much affect our lives. And if it's gonna if it's taken down for nothing, that that'll be a real negative for us. Yeah, if we have to listen to a lot of construction, it would be nice to know that it was because uh, you know perhaps an old carriage house was being preserved instead of ripped down. Um, and the other thing that I want to echo what Jennifer um, and Paige said that this is visible from Cosby Street. It's visible from Lincoln Avenue, from in front of our house obviously quite visible from Fearing Street. And so whatever it, you know, can be done to retain the the authenticity of the parcel, I think is is worth doing. Seeing the pictures on the inside, um, it, it doesn't seem like it's not worth saving. It seems like it's a cool little building. Thank you. Do you have any other members of the public who would like to make a comment? Feel free to raise your hand. Okay, so I don't see any other members of the public. Um, so we will close the public comment period. And um, you... there is one more. Oh, just... okay. So there we go. Sarah Woodbury. Hi, Sarah, if you unmute yourself, you're, you can speak. Sorry. Um, Sarah Woodbury, 8, uh, 8, 826 Main Street. I just wanted to be sure that you will cover the 815 Main Street project, that you're not closing public comment to all the these requests. That's that's oh. correct. That's just for this this public, um, this, this particular parcel. Thank you. Um, not seeing any other hands for public comments. So we will close public comment related to 98 Fearing Street uh, and uh, close the hearing at this point. Um, Wait, I would just recommend oh, let's keep the hearing open just so if we need oh, okay. more information. I think okay. be, this could be a time for commission members to ask any more questions or you know, okay. if they need to share the screen, I can. Okay, um, so is that is that different from deliberation? I mean, the instructions that I have say that we have to close it before. Yeah, I mean, I think we've, um, yeah, sometimes we allow, we keep the public hearing open even during deliberations, just so if there's new information presented, you know, that's the hearing's a chance to get new information. And so to me, it can happen, you know, the commission can start discussing things while the public hearing is open. That's not, okay. Okay. That's not a violation of anything. Okay. Um, I mean, okay, that's not what my instructions say, but okay. <laughs> yeah, we used to we used to we used to say let's close the hearing, but you know what we found, you know, in other with other boards and committees is that then if all of a sudden there's a new image to be shown and the hearing's closed, you really are supposed to then reopen the hearing. So okay, okay. Um, so in that case, I will open uh, open it to commissioners uh, to be in um, deliberation. Uh, people want to. Raise your hands and we can begin discussing. I, I can start. Um, um, I did uh, last spring as part of my historic preservation uh, graduate program, I did a research paper on the American garage and um, this particular house echoes a lot of what I uncovered in looking at builders journals and also um, like home design magazines where you had a home designed in a particular style. You had a one or two, what usually a one car garage around this time period um, located at that end of that side drive that was clearly visible from the street. 
that was subordinate to the main house and mimicked the architectural style. So this uh, house seems to be a, a pretty clear example of what was uh, the trend in that day and what was recommended from an architectural and design standpoint to promote your house to the fullest value and have this kind of, you know, um, kind of major minor pairing and the, the, um, the purposeful uh, public view so that when you walk by um, these houses and, and you, you'll see them all over Amherst if you start looking for them, um, this kind of pairing of, of, the, two, of the two pieces. Um, the American Garage is a particular, um, a particular, a new, was a new structure at that time period. I think Ted pointed out that it was this, uh, this was probably built somewhere between 1922 and 1927. And um, it was, it, it pretty clearly is not a, a converted stable. And in fact, um, garages were built because stables pose too much of a, um, of a fire risk to be converted to garages. So insurance companies stopped insuring them and there was a growth in um, this, this uh, particular type of structure. So um, my feeling is that, um, and I would, uh, I would agree that um, looking at the interior pictures and seeing um, some of the projects in my graduate program, um, I don't think the condition of the building is a reason to uh, allow for demolition. Um, I think there's a lot of potential for correction there. Uh, we do have a CPA uh, funding program that can always be accessed by private property owners um, for preservation of, of historic structures when um, those costs exceed sort of normal maintenance. So um, I think uh, I'm curious what other commissioners think and what type uh, of uh, decision we would want to make going forward in terms of um, imposing a delay, um, maybe getting more information on um, the actual, getting a structural report on the building or, um, uh, I'm not sure, I think I had another idea there, but um, I'll stop there if anybody wants to, wants to jump in. Huh? Robin, I, I agree with what you just said. And I go back to the what I posed as more of a question that, that because the house itself, that structure is part of the historical district, it's listed on Macris as a specific architectural style. The garage is built to complement, to be part of the um, <clears throat> property. And um, the public has noted that it, it's part of the streetscape from several streets in the historic district. And so I think that um, I personally, before it, it was demolished, would want to have some sense of what it would take to restore it, to keep that streetscape and to, to protect the status of that property in the historic district. Thank you, Pat. Andy or Becky, go ahead. Yeah, I, I am just looking at the preservation bylaws that are written. Um, I don't I don't know if I I'd have to read the whole thing, but just under section F, standards for designation designation as a specific building, it meets two of the three standards. Um, the second one is that it has um, value in association with a specific location. Um, it is, it has, uh, or with broad architectural, social, political, economic, or cultural heritage in the town of Amherst. And then number three is the building alone in the context of a group of buildings, or as part of the view shed, which we talked about, has historical or architectural value. Um, so, you know, I shortened it a bit, but, but those two of three, uh, for me, make it very clear that um, it has value and it is historic and it's worth looking into, as you mentioned, um, you know, getting estimates, going through CPA funding, perhaps. Yeah, and I just wanted to um, remind the commission, I think, you know, our process used to be that we would how building would come to us and we would determine whether it was significant or not. And now we're in a process where buildings 
come to us because they've been determined significant. Am I correct, Nate? Am I? Uh, yeah. So that that what we're what we're we're so we've 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 we go through three kind of three thresholds, right? So we have the, the is it historic, and then is it significant, and both of those thresholds have been passed. And then our next threshold is is it uh, preferably preserved. That's really what we're um, discussing here. And I, I think you're probably speaking that to that too, Becky, but I just want to remind everyone, we've crossed the two thresholds. Does this building warrant from uh, the, the opinion of commission members uh, a delay because it's preferable that we preserve this building? So um, I, hopefully that can help um, um, frame our discussion. Hedy, go ahead. Um, thanks, Robin. I, I think this is a building that needs to be preferably preserved as well. Um, and I think it's it's a snapshot that is in line with other buildings in this historic district that show a relationship between a house and a garage at a particular time in Amos's history um, that is relevant in terms of telling the stories of the people who lived there, lived here then, um, and continue to inhabit the the town today. Um, and uh, you know, viewshed is important um, to that sense of the feel of the neighborhood as as you drive or walk through it. Um, and and uh, it's actually something that I think is attractive about Amherst. Um, in a way that uh, draws people in to this to this community. So I think that's all I need to say at this point. Thank you. <laughs> Madeline, did you have a comment? I agree. Um, I think it's, you know, it's uni unified with the house. Um, and this is, um, it's architecturally, the whole property is architecturally significant um, as an example of residential architecture from this time. And it's, yeah, I mean, it, as we've heard from the public, view shed definitely incorporates um, structure and that should be, that should be considered. Um. Nate, can you just, um, you and I had a discussion earlier today, or I guess an email exchange about um, uh, the way that the, the overlay between the historic commission demolition delay and um, the local historic district, uh, I think it would be a certificate of appropriateness um, that, you know, how those two things interact so that the, the commission can understand um, that piece of it. Right, so you know, there are really two separate sets of regulations. So the historical commission, can uh, impose, you know, a delay, um, you know, because the the loss of the structure, the impact is significant uh, to us, you know, a, you know, to the neighborhood or to the to the property. Um, a local historic district has the ability to uh, prevent delay, not just delay it. So, right, they could they are uh, demolition. I mean, so a local historic district could say, well, the loss of the building is significant enough to the district, and they could also say that. Um, they need to see what the future plans are in terms of on the property. Perhaps say they're rebuilding it and it'll look very similar. Then maybe uh, that you know then the local historic district could approve uh, a demolition, knowing what would happen in, in place of it. So the local historic district has you know the ability to say no to a demolition, you know, just really reject it, uh, and then also ask for more information. So you know it's a little more uh, it's also more flexible because they could incorporate future plans, um, but it also has a little bit more regulatory power and in, in, in the fact that it can deny a demolition. And so really a project in a local historic district and an Amherst has to go through both permitting processes. You know, we haven't combined them. So there's always this uh, path to the historical commission and one to the local historic district. And so, you know, for better or worse, uh, you know, 250 or whatever it is, properties will have to do, we have to go through that process, you know, this similar process. So if the, um... So if we impose a delay and then the local historic district, um, let's just say for sake of argument here, um, uh, decides to allow demolition with the replacement by a similar structure, um, that there would still be a, a delay. <laughs> there would yes. be a, a conflict between those two things. I'm assuming it would just come back to us 
and we would we could choose at that point whether to lift the delay or if we felt that that wasn't the appropriate decision, we could continue it until it expired. And, Right. So during a delay period, the um, applicant can an owner can return, you know, and re request that the commission, you know, lift the delay or, you know, or reduce it. And then, you know, the bylaw has criteria whether there's been a bona fide effort made to restore it or get cost estimates to show there is a hardship or, you know, make sure there isn't a way to reuse parts of it or all of it. And so, right. So that, you know, if if in that instance, Robin, there was this two different uh Two different outcomes between local historic district and historical commission an applicant could return to ask the delay to be lifted and if you know maybe that the historical commission doesn't feel it's warranted and they you know then they just you know then there's just a you know a differing opinion between the two commissions and eventually the the, the demolition would expire and right. that would be that okay okay does anybody have and anyone else have, have any comments and if not, does anyone want to make a motion? Well, I move that we um, take a vote to, or, or whatever. Are we taking a vote? So, I think um, you'd, I, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, as I said, at this point, we could probably move to close the hearing. Oh, okay. okay. And then if you wanted to, you can make another motion in terms of you know, the action the commission would take on this. Okay, so uh, does someone want to make a motion to close the hearing? I make a motion to close the hearing. I second it. Uh, so the hearing uh, for uh, the public hearing for 98 Fearing Street, a request to demolish a 19, circa 1927's check garage is now closed. Uh, we have, can we take a roll call, Robin? Just to... Oh, sorry, roll call vote. Uh, yep. Um, so, uh, Pat? Present. Uh, no, so this is a roll call vote to um, close the hearing. Yeah, just to close. I agree. Sorry. I, That's I realized we're going to do a roll call to start we, with. So I we thought did. we were backing up. We missed the <laughs> part. You're right. <laughs> so um, I'm president and I agree. <laughs> Patty? Um, I agree. Uh, Madeline? I agree. Uh, Becky? Uh, it, it gets your, your mute I idea. Agree. Thank you. And I, I, I uh, vote aye to close the public hearing. Okay, so five, five, was that, are we five, five? We are five, a five to zero vote to close the public hearing. Uh, now, do we have a motion regarding uh, the uh, issuance of a demolition permit or uh, a motion to impose demolition delay? Pat? I propose that we consider that 98 Fearing Street Garage is a preferably preserved property and that we impose a demolition delay. Okay. Becky, did you have a comment? No, no. Okay. I can okay. second that. Okay, uh, Becky seconds. Uh, so we have a motion to impose demolition delay on a uh, demolition of the 1927 garage uh, on 98 Fearing Street. So we'll do a roll call vote. So a vote uh, I is in favor of imposing demolition delay. Pat? Well, before, usually, oh, I, unless okay. there's a second, just we could have a, any future discussion or, you know, before we vote, any other discussion? Oh, okay. Any other discussion? Just, just to make sure we're not missing anything. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no. No? Okay. No further discussion? Okay. Uh, so, uh, Pat? Aye. Hetty? Aye. Madeline? Aye. Becky? Aye. And I vote aye. So the decision of the commission is to five to zero vote to impose a demolition delay on 98 Fearing Street Street's uh, detached garage. Nate, anything else that do you want to speak to for the applicant? I think, I think that would uh, that's um, that's good for 98 Fearing, and I think we can move on to. Um, a15 Main Street. I was just going to try to get documents um, open and ready. <laughs> but I think I think 98 Fearing is all set then. Okay. Uh, I don't know, Ted or, or um, Lorenzo, if you're here also to speak for um, A15 Main Street, but that, that could proceed with the presentation. You have all the stuff queued up. I'm, you know, I'm, uh, <laughs> do it. So eight, 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 15 is, is, is a, a much different 
um, kind of application because it's taking down an entire house, which is no small thing. And I don't think that this um, decision to seek a demolition permit was taken lightly by the owners. And I think that um, it would be good for Lorenzo to describe uh, how they came to the point of uh, deciding to seek a demolition permit. Thanks, Ted, and thank you all for the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, yeah, Ted, Ted's right. Uh, this is this is a, a decision that was uh, was difficult because we we had every intention of um, really rehabbing this this property. Um, I'm not sure of all the documents that were were handed over, but um, upon uh, taking ownership, we we had a few contractors in uh, to look at what it would take to to restore the the building. Um, each of which kind of didn't want to didn't even want to give a quote or 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 move forward in any way. Um, we then also went through the process of having it. Um, tested for for lead and then had it actually deleaded um so spent quite a bit of money to to delead the the um interior which was necessary to proceed and have it inhabited <laughs> safely um so definitely we're marching along in the path of of the of the rehab um then also had um a, a post and beat all of the contractors that we had a look at it, general, regular general contractors didn't feel comfortable because it is in such poor condition and as old as it is and a post and beam. So we um, hired a post and beam specialist to come in and um, and look at the, the house. They, they um, I'm, I'm mixing up the order, but I'm pretty sure they wanted like a better view. So we, at, it, the interior pictures, which you'll see in a moment were at like, what the, what he wanted to see is like bare bones, um, what it looked like from the inside. And so um, his, his report was that it's not salvageable. Um, in fact, like dangerous and um, while, I mean, surely anything, well, he, he, his recommendation, his report was to take it down. And that was hard to, hard to hear, hard to see. Um, I live in a, a, a 1870 home myself and value and appreciate old homes, um, old buildings, but um, this one is, is seeming beyond um, salvage. And uh, if you've seen the pictures or if you've driven by it, I mean, it has been in this condition for um, decades, I believe. And, and actually I've been trying to buy it for a very long time um, with no, no luck. Uh, so I'll leave it there for now. And if you have questions, happy to answer. Thank you. When did, when did you purchase the home? Uh, last, not this, sum, uh, a summer and a half ago. Uh, what year would that be? COVID times, everything's a little bit of a blur. Um, <laughs> right, right. 21. <laughs> and do, do you uh, know how long? How 21, long? summer of 21. How long was it? I, this is just a curiosity question that relates kind of to larger a larger question that the commission might take up at some point about um, um, you know, uh, affirmative maintenance. But how long was it um, vacant and and allowed to? Do we do we know? Maybe Nate knows. I will offer that I also own the building next door, um, and I've owned that building since two thousand and two or three and never once have I seen it being inhabited and it was already in rough shape boarded up etc like back then so 20 30 years I don't know a long time okay thanks yeah I can um I can walk through the pictures and like I like I did previously, if that's all right. And um, yeah, I can just go over the material that's been submitted. The um, yeah, I don't know exactly how long this, how long it's been, you know, vacated. But uh, you know, looking at Google, Google Street View and other images we have, I mean, it's been twenty uh, probably twenty years where it's been deteriorating, and so it really hasn't been 
you know, this owner, it's, you know, the owner inherited what was a, you know, structure that had been, had seen most of its decay. Um, let me share my, am I still sharing my screen? I'm not sharing my screen, am I? No, we see you. Not you right see, now. See me, yeah. <laughs> you don't need to see me right now. Um, so here's the house, if that's, that's good for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll just, I'll just work my way down. Uh, here's the east side of the structure. So, you know, Main Street is on the right. You know, it's pretty, it's really close to the street. Um, it was actually, you know, built at a time when there weren't setbacks. So it's, it's non-conforming for zoning in terms of its location. Uh, but it is, it is really close to the street. Here's another image of the, the front of the house. Here's the back of the house. I, th I think the street used to be a lot narrower, Nate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even, even uh, I think I found a, the only good aerial photograph is from the 50s, and even then it was still pretty close. I mean, I agree the street yeah. was probably narrower, but. Yeah. And here's some interior. We're going to go into the interior. So here's uh, looking at the, a roof, the roof structure. Here's a corner. Another detail. And so there are some some beams here. Uh, you know, this is again detail of just some framing. Here's what looks I'll like take this picture. opportunity to also even say that that since this point, I, I even called back the post and beam specialist and asked if we were somehow to be able to take this thing apart carefully. Would he want or could he salvage the 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 post and beams themselves? And and he said he didn't want them. <laughs> Another image of the interior. Uh, there's some basement um, shots from foundation. Detail of rot. And here's another image of the back of the property. Another detail of just decay. And then a new share. I'll just share the documents that were um, submitted and available. Just the uh, We have, you know, the inventory form. So it is, it has been inventory. It's part of the East Village National Register District. Um, you know, so there is some history there, uh, the application, and then what was submitted is the uh, post and beam uh, report, you know, summary report. And so um, and that information is available online. You know, it's interesting, the house does, you know, as part of the East Village, it, um, you know, there's a, a a number of homes in this area built around this time or even earlier, and you know they were, you know, they served as merchants' homes. They might have had shops in the back, and so you know East Amherst is a really old section of town, and so at one point this was a really vibrant village center with you know different, um, you know, they, I think they call it a the doctor. You know, well there's a number of owners, but you know different different owners over the years have lived here, and it's been noted in this in this uh, inventory form. And so here's an image back in, it was just, it was just probably 88 or eight, oh, 81, all right. Do we have um, questions from commissioners at this point before we go to public comment? I suppose what concerns me most is is just the amount of decay that might have been prevented by the previous owner, um, whoever that was. Um, in an in a and I know that being in a national village historic district doesn't necessarily bring a lot of um, protection for historic buildings, um, but it's probably worth mentioning that. This road that this house is on is is one of the main ways into Amherst. <laughs> um, you know, from two o two, and um, historically, you know, this would, as 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 Nate was saying, would have been a much livelier center. It still is very lively, but it's just changed its use over time. Um, Amherst Glass on the corner there, um, the Jewish community center and and synagogue you know 
it's still vibrant it's just that it's really different and I love this part of town because I think you you get a really cool sense of what what is actually very historic and authentic in terms of of our town um so that's I don't really um, have a question okay. with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sorry <laughs> Robin say, that's okay I'm, I'm just reminding commissioners that this is a club period to ask for know. more information yeah. that's okay it's for more information and later we'll go on to deliberation but uh yeah. it's great right. it's it's a lot to keep track of for all of us <laughs> uh, Pat do you have a question but for, for the owner and, and also for Ted, um, it, it, you've stated that it was your intention to restore the house. And, and then you began investigating and the report from the beam specialist is quite compelling. Um, are, would you still consider restoring the house or, or is that report definitive to you? That report feels pretty definitive to me. Thank you. In this case, I defer to the owner. Madeline, you have a question? I just have a question. Are we are we allowed to just ask what the intention is for the future use of the property? I think generally we're supposed to be evaluating just based on the loss of, of the resource and not necessarily what uh, comes next. Matt, I'll say maybe in, in so much as like, you know, is there, you know, I guess if you're asking, like, is there a possible reuse or anything, you know, uh, of, of the structure or, or timbers or members of it? I don't know what, where you're going with your question, but. It sounds like that um, they've already considered reusing the materials. Mm -hmm. So, I guess my question is answered. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Any other questions from the commission members? Okay. Um, so then we can move to a public comment. If members of the public uh, would like to provide public comment, you can raise their hands. And a um, uh, reminder to, for the record, please tell us your name and address. So feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to make uh, a comment on this property, 815 Main Street, for uh, up for a request for demolition. And I see Sarah Woodbury has raised her hand. Hi, Sarah, you can unmute yourself. Um, I just want to say I appreciate the effort that you made to uh, restore the house. We live across the street, 826 Main Street. And um, I think you really did a really great, great job to try to do that. Um, and I agree that it isn't worth saving, but um, uh, there is a, a step there that has a, uh, a boot scraper on it in the, at the front door, which is really quite nice. And if you could save that, that would be great. This I'd is like not add, anything that I, I'm Sid Sif. I'm Sid, Sarah's husband. Um, <clears throat> I would say that you were doing a Herculean task in going forward and trying to restore that house. I was overjoyed that you would even try it. And I was shocked to tell you the truth. Um, <laughs> um, I also agree with Hetty. Is that is that your name, Hetty? Yep. It is a major route into Amherst, and you might as well put a sign up on the house that says "Welcome to Amherst." Mm -hmm. And the way that it looks right now is not a very good welcome. Um, the house has been uninhabited. I would say for maybe 20 years. <clears throat> the owner wasn't doing any, I think someone asked about why, you know, why wasn't something done to upkeep it? She walked, just walked away from the house and never came back. She just abandoned it. So I would say, you know, I am interested in what 
would happen after it comes down and what will go in there, but it has to be better than what's there now, whatever it is. Also, you know, I've thought about how close that house is to the road. Um, the traffic here goes by very fast. And if that house was restored and students moved in and have parties the way that they are want to do, I just imagine someone spilling out the front door into the street. Well, thank you for your comments. Um, if there are any other members of the public who would like to comment, please feel free to raise your hand and we will call on you. Wait a moment here. So I am not seeing any more um, any more interest in public comment at this point. Um, so we can continue the hearing and um, begin deliberation among commission members. Is that right, Nate? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Just in case there was any new information. So. Okay. okay, so we keep the hearing open and um, uh, had he had a comment. Um, other commissioners would like to weigh in on this demolition request for 815 Main Street. Becky? Um, I'd just like to say that I completely appreciate uh, Lorenzo's efforts to, to do everything he could to save the house. I did drive over the other day and uh, took a look at it. And, you know, the, the historic part of me fantasized about what a beautiful place it must have been or it could be. But when I look at I peeked inside, I looked at it, it was frightening how unsafe it is. Um, <laughs> it, there's, you know, the boards have come down and I know that's not your fault, um, but I could just see folks climbing in and playing around with it. And, um, I, I, I think you've done everything you could do and, and it, it is a safety hazard, it's just, it's just from viewing it. So that's my two cents. Thank you, Becky. Um, I'll just um, follow that. Um, I definitely noticed this house uh, on more than one occasion. And um, it seems like all of us here, maybe including the applicant, um, it, it find it a little heartbreaking <laughs> to, to lose a resource like this. Um, again, the question is whether it's properly preserved and it seems like um, the leap from here to preserving the house might be unattainable and it um it, it i i find it i find it i find this uh this exercise challenging because um i'm someone who believes in um uh as a come to preservation um uh expanding beyond just high style um architecture and looking at more modest and vernacular houses um with an equal eye for whether or not they should be preserved or not um, so there is something that this ho house, I think, speaks to in that particular area. Um, I just keep thinking of the Pickering building and, um, you know, the proximity to it, 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 it fits into that, um, that time period. But I think the condition that it's in and the um, information that the applicant has um, provided make it pretty clear that a pr preservation effort would be um, pretty, uh, I, I will say that. <laughs> I'm amazed at what can be preserved, but the extent to which you have to would have to go to to preserve it and and the balance against its um, historic significance, um, I think, don't warrant it. So that would be my that would be my two cents. Pat or Madeline, do you want to make? A well, I I think you know we're all speaking to the fact that that it it is a property that in its best day had significance and that if if it had been if preservation had been attempted 20 years ago 25 years ago um, but the last 20 years have been what appeared to be a death knell for the structure and so we we can't go back 25 years it would it would 
it's a, it's totally unsafe now. So you essentially would be building a new, and you can do that if if you choose to do something that's compatible architectural style with a new building in that setting. But I don't think preserving this one is has a possibility anymore. Thanks, Pat. Madeline, did you have a comment? Um, I mean, not really. I think it's just it's it is, yeah. It's it's a shame that the last twenty years have caused it to to come to this state. Um, and it is part of this kind of series of older houses that are similarly sized and all a little bit different along that route and close to the close to the road. And um, to echo what Pat was saying, it it. it there is sort of a cohesive feeling there to that to that part of the street, and it would be nice to continue that in the in the future um, with whatever you choose to to do with your property. But yeah, I think this one is 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 lost. Um, does commission members have any other comments? Okay. Um, I think that, uh, does anyone want to forward a motion for, um, uh, imposing a demolition delay or, uh, issuing a demolition permit? Yes, we could. The motion could be a dual motion to close the hearing and. Oh, okay. You could do one at a time, maybe a motion to close the hearing first and then a okay. vote on second. No, I was forgetting something. <laughs> a motion to close the hearing. Seconded. Things. Uh, I was gonna, Seconded. I was going to say. All right. Uh, can I make the motion, Nate? Sure. <laughs> okay. So I'm. I moved. I moved to close the public hearing. And seconded. Pat seconded. seconded. Okay. So uh, public hearing is closed for 815 Main Street. Uh, do we have a motion regarding the request for a demolition permit? I propose that we approve a demolition of this structure. So we have at, a motion. 15, at 815 Main Street. Okay, so we have a motion to uh, issue a demolition permit for 815 Main Street to the second. I second that. Becky seconds. Okay, so we will do a roll call vote. Uh, an I vote is to uh, allow for a demolition permit for uh, the structure at 815 Main Street. Uh, Hetty. Um, I reluctantly. <laughs> Becky. Aye. Pat. Aye. Madeline. Aye. And I vote aye as well. So that is about five to zero to issue a demolition permit for the house at 815 Main Street. Thank you, uh, Ted and Lorenzo, for uh, attending our meeting. And um, uh, I hope you have a good evening. Thanks for serving as an ex-member. I appreciate you putting the time in. Nice to see you, Ted. <laughs> Take care. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Bye -bye. Good night. Okay. So now we continue the public meeting uh, with announcements. Any announcements, Nate? I don't have any announcements. <laughs> I, I don't, um, you know, just the commission, I'll just say that, you know, the commission meets again on the 27th for another demolition hearing. Um, you know, that, that's, that's, you know, that, that's a one topic evening. <laughs> There's not, I think it'll just be the hearing piece. And so um, oh, I, I'm trying, I am trying to reach out to the owner to schedule a site visit next week. And so I'll, I'll hope to maybe get back to you um, tomorrow or Monday with some times and maybe, um, you know, so we'll just see how that goes. Yeah, okay. and, and Nate, I did send you an email. I'm I'm not available. I'm going to be flying at, at the time of the meeting. Right. I I think four members could be there. So you know, given the time constraints of the bylaw, I think we can we'll make it work. I think yeah. so. I did get your email, Pat. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um. Next item on the agenda was a request of mine. Um, I just wanted to take maybe 10 minutes to five to 10 minutes to 
um, ask the commission members, um, I should probably take notes too, uh, their ideas for one and five year goals for the commission. Um, I, after doing, I spent a summer internship working with um, or surveying the commissions of the historical and historic district commissions of the um, uh, Berkshire County. And I realized how all over the map um, commissions are in terms of um, what they can accomplish, what they know that they can accomplish, their understanding of the priorities of the commission. And I thought it would be a really good idea for us to define some goals to see if we could um, achieve them. Um, we moved forward this past year with uh, a bunch of things, including our barn and outbuilding um, preservation program. And so the first thing that I would add to the list, um, which I think the uh, demolition permit that we just issued um, is a great example of, is how we'd like to approach, this might be a five-year goal, um, how we would approach uh, a um, affirmative maintenance bylaw or uh, to to deal with uh, demolition by neglect, and I would add that I was doing I'm I'm learning how to do a lot more um, foreign bee research in my job, and I was looking at um, the history of a friend of mine's house up on East Pleasant Street, and as a part of that, trying to figure out where her house was. Um, there's the one house that's falling apart right by the cemetery, and I'd always sort of. I never really thought about it as a particularly old house. It's actually quite old. It's actually one of the first houses in that area. And I know that I personally have seen it go from what seemed like a perfectly reasonable house to something that is just, uh, it's just disappearing before our eyes. And I was a little bit shocked when I realized um, it's historic significance. So um, I have, I don't know a lot about, uh, about uh, affirmative maintenance bylaws, but I think it would be really great if we could work toward getting one in place because it is the older buildings that are uh, going to be neglected. And, and we've got two really great examples of um, uh, what can happen to some things that are really a, a critical part of the beginning's history of, you know, of Amherst. So that's my vote, um, or it's not my vote. I, what I want to do was brainstorm, and um, and then I was going to send out. If we had a lot of things, I was just going to send out and send out a little uh, survey for people to rank them, so kind of get a sense of what's most important. But um, with that, uh, I've taken up three minutes, so we all have got seven more. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's kind of a. a you can consider what we do with sort of carrots and sticks and kind of maybe a, a, an affirmative maintenance bylaw, you know, a, a regulatory um, tool. And, but you can also think about what types of um, tools can we think of for just like approaching property owners, like allow, you know, helping them through the CPA process, just those, and that would be kind of a carrot. Um, okay. And, you know, these things can work in, in tandem. But that's some, that's one way to like maybe frame. So like a CPA kind of approach. education outreach. Yeah, like that middle person, you know, ushering yep. people through the process, trying to figure out that. Okay. Say that. Patty, do you have your hand up? Yeah, I I think um, one thing I've seen in past um, job experience that I've had is is the presence of a, a revolving fund which can begin to create a pot of money that then offers people support, financial support for um, getting evaluations of properties and structures. Um, sometimes a revolving fund is managed by a friends of type organization. So it would, so that there isn't any kind of conflict of interest between an official town sanctioned commission and then this other organization and um you know i think a lot of buildings can can then be the type of buildings to get support from a revolving fund um perhaps not for actual construction or renovation or preservation but but maybe for help with evaluation you know the kind of problems we were seeing with the north Amherst church the zion church 
you know, if that would I think have helped them a lot or will help them a lot in the future I should say yeah um I was also going to suggest uh Hetty and I had talked about um focusing on doing some swarms for mid-century um significant mid-century buildings in Amherst since they are into getting into the period of uh being considered historical and I don't know that there's been much documentation there um I'm getting a better sense of how to do a proper form B. Um, any other ideas? I mean, uh, um, I, I don't know what um, one of the things that we that I that I learned about this summer was just sort of the, the fact that one of the things the commission is supposed to be on top of is kind of understanding where their inventory is at. So I wouldn't necessarily say updating our inventory because that really requires um, a, a huge uh, amount of um, well you need you need you really need um, expertise and time and money <laughs> um, but um, maybe analyzing our inventory to understand where um, where things are are uh, need updating because you know a lot of the records in macros I mean like the one we saw today for um, for uh, 815 or 815, um, you know that was what that would that was what would the historic the the mass historic commission would call um, not up to date. <laughs> it's you know not nearly enough information on the history of uh, the building and the owners and the architecture, and um, so that's that would be one thing that we could put on the list. So, do we know when the kind of bigger inventories in town were? um created is it just is is it this 1980 inventory is that the latest one or or are there kind of a series of them in that chris no i mean um, so, yeah sorry yeah i mean 80 so early 80s and 88 there was a really big push so you know hundreds of properties were inventory then uh there's been subsequent inventories you know a few hundred properties um maybe 300 since then so anytime a local historic district has been I examined the inventory forms were updated. So, you know, that there's that. Um, we had um, a planning and survey grant from Mass Historic where we identified and inventoried outbuildings and PVPC has done a little bit more recently, but that may that may add up to 150, 200 buildings, you know, or properties. Some were uh, area forms for properties, for farm, farm buildings, assemblages of buildings. But yeah, most of the inventory is quite old. Um, I was going to also say, I think this is a great discussion to have in light of the, you know, PVPCs updating the preservation plan. So I think, you know, if we have this conversation for another meeting or so, uh, we can get, you know, we could synthesize the ideas and feed them to Shannon at Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Uh, and she also plans to, uh, you know, come back to the commissions um, maybe in March or April and have a discussion as well. So this, you know, this is a, a good time to be thinking about this uh, also in light of how to incorporate those goals or ideas into the preservation plan. Yeah, and actually, that's a good point. I mean, it might be because I've just thrown it out at everybody, you know, for this 10 minute period. But um, I mean, we could start here and people could maybe think over the next month as, you know, I, I know that like my ideas come to me just when I'm walking around or driving around and I think, oh, right, you know, that thing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but I just thinking of like, I'm trying to think of what we we asked uh, people about on our survey. I mean, it was, you know, um, are you updating your inventory? Do you have educational outreach? Um, you know, CPA. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I know the, you know, I was, I was I was the town manager asked recently, like, oh, do we have any markers or signs for national register districts? And you know, we talked about this years ago. We the the former chair had kind of you know developed a design. We're having the wayfinding system that's going getting right. in place. So. You know that you know as part of the outreach or just um, public education. You know that's something that it could that could be a part of it, right? Just having um, house yeah. plaques or markers, and then also you know district signs. And so you know it's not you know I think that could be important. You know we'd have to get you could I you know it's interesting. I don't know how much people would say that's CPA eligible, but um, you know it is something that if we think it's important, we could figure out how to how to fund it. Yeah, um, I mean my feeling on on. Uh, uh, 
on markers for CPA is it seems to me like nobody has challenged it. <laughs> and, um, and it does seem sort of intrinsic to, you know, if you're going to preserve a building and you do all this effort to sort of, you know, figure out what the history of it was, people who are walking by aren't going to know anything unless there's, unless there's a marker. So um, I think that's a great idea. Um, and I'm reminded that I walked by, what is it, the Allen House, the bed and breakfast, and they have a marker that says that they received a preservation award from the Historic Commission. <laughs> so apparently at some point, the Historic Commission gave out preservation awards. So <laughs> um, that might be something to consider. You know, another you know thing about that? I was, oh, go oh, ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. Well, you can continue that thought. I was going to change oh. the subject. Do you know anything about that, Nate, when that happened? Or if it was, it was, there, was there more than one award? <laughs> yeah, the, um, probably in the 2000s and 2010s, there was um, sometimes um, called them like preservation awards of merit or, you know, just preservation awards. So they're offered to um, different properties that were renovated or, you know, that had been maintained. And so the idea was just to have, you know, some recognition of, of properties or, you know, um, projects in town. And so right. it never, you know, it, I think, yeah, it, it kind of fizzled. Um, I think some of it was, you know, at one point it, it, the thought was, could it also be a partnership with the historical society? You know, is it a good way to try to bring different organizations together? And so, you know, maybe, whether or not the same kind of program is is enacted again, you know, is there, you know, I always thought like, is it, you know, would it lead to something, whether it's a forum or some type of uh, discussion with different agencies in the town or in the region. So, uh, but yeah, the awards were given out. I mean, you know, we, the idea was to try to, you know, really highlight that. And so I, you know, it did go on for a few years and I think there's, you know, usually an article in the paper and, but then, you know, then it didn't, I feel like it, we didn't catalog it very well. And then I don't think we used it after the fact. So, okay, someone got an award. How are we, how is that um, incorporated into public education or some type of, you know, public material? And I feel like it, it right. wasn't, it, it kind of just didn't make that, that transition very well. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. But I, I, you yeah. know, I think it was, I think it, it did. I mean, there's a number of awards made. And I think it was, I think it really did highlight important projects and properties. Okay. That's, uh, so a revival of the program could be something that we could consider. Mm -hmm. Madeline, what you were going to say? Oh, yeah. So I was, I um, completed the survey that was sent around for uh, preservation plan. Um, and I saw that we had a tool for the designation and protection of scenic roads, which I was not familiar with, but I'm um, interested in learning more about and if we can do anything for that okay. yeah yeah the town the town designated scenic roads in 1974 <laughs> it was a little early adopter um so it's pretty amazing actually yeah we were just i was talking to someone else in another town and they're trying to get scenic roads adopted now and i was like oh okay and they're like does amherst have any and i was like yeah they're so old that no one knows about them <laughs> <laughs> i just have to share with you that we had a house in stowe vermont and the road was a national nationally preserved it was a dirt road and at one end of it was emily's bridge over goldbrook that had the real history from the 1700s and so the road was preserved and it could never be paved could never be changed <laughs> and let me tell you mud season was <laughs> very interesting coming and going as a vermonter i know what you mean <laughs> i grew up on a dirt road did you really yeah well this is a beautiful slows traffic ride. so it was yeah it was a good it's place slows, it up. slows traffic and this this was not a long well it was probably a couple of miles long but it went from a, a paved road to a paved road um and and really the only attraction on it was was uh emily's bridge which was close to a paved road but it had beautiful views and um we just suffered through mud season <laughs> appreciated the tranquility mm -hmm. Well, does anybody have anything else they want to throw on the list for now? If something pops into your head, send me an email and I'll, I'll keep a running tally and we can bring it up at our next meeting too. The only other thing I thought about, is I think Hetty and I talked about architectural tours. Yeah. 
Um, okay. Um, next uh, agenda item is an update on the CPA proposal for the Amherst Zion Church of the Nazarene, formerly known as the North Congregational Church, also historically known as the North Congregational Church. <laughs> Yeah, so um, you know, uh, staff went out and met with the church, and they, they're they're using an architect from Kuhn Riddle, who had developed plans for roofing, you know, fixing the gutters and some of the the there's some rot along the um, the fascia and some of the trim. The um, you know, I mean, I it's too bad the congregation is small. You know, and at one point the church right would um, I think it uh, you know 200 to 300 families were would actually attend, and so at one point it was you know really really well well used and you know really a center in north amherst and they'd love to bring it back to that um you know but i you know it's not that it's been neglected i think that the the both the parish hall and the church are in pretty good shape uh surprisingly the church it seems like the foundation may have been repaired um in the 50s there was it was pretty solid block under there uh, like center block um below grade a lot of it's been finished so it's hard to get a good look but we walked around um and you know, so we explained that what we'd like to see is a, it doesn't even have to be a full plan, but some type of report just outlining what are the steps to maintain the church. So, you know, roof, you know, so building envelope, if it's roof, siding, windows, foundation, and kind of develop a, a priority list of what are the actions needed, um, really just to stabilize the structure. So, you know, we mentioned like framing, roof, right, window siding, all those things, and come back with an estimate, uh, you know, interior there could be work done there, but really in terms of CPA eligibility, we're looking at the structural preservation. And so um, they said they would do that. I mean, it is, it will, it could be um, a really big ask. They did originally ask for quite a bit. Um, you know, for instance, the scaffolding to paint the building was over a hundred thousand um, dollars, which I, I, I know is probably that amount years ago when the um, CPA funded preservation of the chimneys at the Jones library. This is, I guess almost 10 years ago, the scaffolding cost, I think was $70,000 originally estimated for that. So, uh, but yeah, the church seems to be in pretty good shape. The windows have storms on them. We talked about, you know, different techniques, whether they have interior storms or could you replace the exterior storms? The windows, the glazing on the windows seems to be actually in pretty good shape. Um, it does need to be painted as part of a maintenance and preservation program. Uh, the roof uh, has some deflection. So it's the original slate is actually in really good shape. Uh, but there are some structural members that have deteriorated in the in the roof. Um, I, um, I did a, a report on the church for one of my classes, and if I recall correctly, it looks like there's there's asphalt on the north side of the roof and slate on the south side. Um, uh, I no, I thought it was all slate. I think the slate on the north is discolored or you know different color, but I didn't. Oh, uh, okay, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think they're going to, they had a structural engineer look at it just informally. And I think after our meeting, they were going to, with the architect's help, have some other professionals take a look at the building and make sure that, you know, everything is true and plumb and in good shape. They might have to do some exploratory work on the foundation and framing, but, you know, we're hoping to get some type of, you know, we, just, we told them it could just be a few pages, right? But some type of summary document and some outline. Uh, the CPA committee has reserved $165,000, um, which could be available if they wanted, if they needed more money, it would have to be, um, it could be folded into next year or you know, figure out how to do something. But the roof estimate was about 155 and that's pretty firm right now. Um, you know, they were gonna try to get, they had one, one contractor provide an estimate, they've asked for three, the two others have, for whatever reason, just, you know, some have come, they haven't provided great information. And so they're trying to get at least another estimate, but the contractor they had um, is known to work on slate, older slate roofs. So he, he does churches and other buildings. I mean, I almost think that that could hold water. Um, there's not a lot of slate roofers around anymore, um, but most of the slate looks really good. So they're hoping that the deflection hasn't broken the slate. So they're hoping what that is, when they clean it- What the is the deflection? Breaks. What's the, so you know, uh, in the roof, it's a, you know, it's a, a purlin system and some of the purlins have rot, have rotted. And so then the, the bents are um, in two sections, the, the, you know, essentially the main rafters are, have also rotted. So there's two sections of the roof where the, it's kind of starting to cave in. Okay. Um, and so, 
yeah, I mean, I, surprise, you know, surprisingly, it, it seemed really in pretty good shape. So, I'm, you know, I'm, I was, I was, I was encouraged. You know, the walls look pretty good and everything. You know, everything's pretty straight and true. So, um, yeah, we'll try to get that report and then move move forward. Um, you know, the church said they would love to be come part of the community again. So, right, the Boy Scouts used to um, use the church or the parish hall. There used to be other events there and maybe just over time, you know, they've owned it for a few years now, but, you know, they really said they'd love to have it be open to the community. And I think that's, you know, I think they were sincere about it. So, um, um have you, um, so the, there's an organization called safe, safe, saving sacred places, um, that, um, works specifically with churches, with small congregations to optimize their space. And um, I, I can I can forward the information to you, Nate, if you want to forward it on to them. I mean, they think they'd be like an excellent candidate. They're, they they essentially provide. I mean, they have grants, but I wouldn't I wouldn't be going in that direction with them. But they provide this consulting service mm -hmm. specifically for the kind of struggles that this particular church, even though it's like a sort of a newer one, is up against. To sort of you know, how do you maintain uh, an old structure with a, a small congregation and limited funds. And I'd love to see them, um, you know, make contact with them because it seems like it would, their intention and um, and the, certainly the capacity of that space, you know, is huge. Um, so. Right. No, that, yeah, if you could, that'd be great. So yeah, we asked the architect too to reach out, you know, I provided some information about Community Preservation Coalition or, you know, looking at, and I, we recommended trying to find other grants. So if you could send me that, that'd be great. Okay. Um, Massachusetts Preservation Projects Fund application is due in March, which the timing isn't great, but I think this project, you know, would be an eligible candidate for that through the Massachusetts Historical Commission. Um, yeah, I mean, my, um, I, I looked at uh, some videos for um, presentations on projects that had received the MPFF, and I think the biggest challenge there is that it's an incredibly tight timeline. And you, right. the, the, the people who presented were, you know, they were essentially historic museums with staff that were capable of, you know, kind of marching really quickly through. Um, so that's, that's the, that's the one challenge there. <laughs> right. Yep. Okay. Any questions, anybody? Nope. Okay. Um, old business uh, policy for historic preservation restrictions. Yeah, I mean, I think you know we had discussed this previously, and maybe it had been discussed earlier as well with Ben. But you know, the CPA statute doesn't necessarily require a permanent restriction every time CPA funds are used on a property for historic preservation. You know, the language states it's um, when you acquire a property, and so it's been interpreted to mean when you actually purchase a property for historic preservation or for historic purposes. And so, you know, Northampton doesn't really put restrictions on properties when they use CPA funds and it varies from you know that to always a permanent restriction that seeks that needs Massachusetts Historical Commission approval and Amherst has kind of gone that route where you know every time CPA funds are used we need a permanent deed restriction and then it needs to go through Massachusetts Historical Commission and there's really a big time lag and you know Robin talked about too like what's the how are these restrictions monitored and anyways I, I mentioned this to the assistant town manager Dave Zomack and you know, we've talked about it off and on, and I think it is important. I think, you know, there's, we could probably facilitate historic preservation projects if we had, you know, I don't know, I'll call it a local policy. I don't, you know, I'm not even sure if it's a that or a procedure, but, you know, whether there's a dollar threshold or we, you know, the commission has some ideas about how to move forward. I think you had discussed it and it can be flexible, but I, you know, it's really hard, you know, does a $30,000 project really need a permanent restriction? Does a $200,000 project, depending on the project itself? And so, you know, for instance, the JCA has been in limbo and they're getting a little anxious because we've been holding money, withholding money uh, mm -hmm. to get this restriction, um, um, this permanent restriction. And so Mass Historic is really not budging on a few parts of it. And, you know, for instance, it's now the whole property. Well, the whole property has changed since there was the church and the parish hall now includes more buildings and different things. And so, you know, Mass Historic is saying, well, it needs to be the property, it needs to be this, and it's not really relevant to what the work was done. And so, um, you know, even a 30 year restriction, if the town had it, would still be uh, worthwhile. And then if the, you know, the property would come back and get CPA funds, say on year 20, then 
a new, a new restriction or time could be added. So there's always this ability to like, you know, roll um, preservation and restrictions, even if it wasn't permanent. So I don't know, I, I just, you know, I think it's something that if the commission wants to pick up again more formally, I think it's, you know, I think it's probably a good time to, to do that. Is it possible for you to bring ideas to us that we can comment on as opposed to us bringing yeah, I thought. Yeah, I thought ben had, to you. <laughs> yeah, I thought Ben had mentioned that you know you were the commission had said well even you know half a million dollars or more is permanent and under could be less. I mean, so you know the when Ben called a number of communities last year and we did some research, you know some had um, a dollar value, some had a value that was proportional to the assessed value. Some just said, you know, so if it's over 200,000, it's always permanent. If it's a certain percentage, it's permanent. Um, and so it really varies. I mean, some communities, like I said, don't have anything. And maybe they think, well, if it's a really prominent visual building, we'll have it be permanent. But, you know, some really don't have any kind of any rationale to it. It's um, <laughs> it's all over the map. <laughs> it is. It really, it really is. And um, yeah, so I, I think, you know, like the Tiffany window, when that was restored, the restriction is really on the, just the front facade of the of the UU, and it has a number of conditions. And you know, they've when they've done the renovation projects, they seek town approval to make sure they're still following the restriction, and it's worked really well. Um, you know, Hope Church has a permanent one; they also received other funding. But you know, yeah, I, I so I mean, I feel like it could just be a really simple statement from the commission. Um, you know, there, I can I can get something. I know I have. There's a I do. There's a draft document somewhere I can I can find that Ben had started. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, my biggest concern I think with the preservation restrictions is that um, they're useless if nobody's monitoring them. <laughs> so you know, there's no point in in engaging with MHC if nobody's going to do just a regular monitor, monitoring process. And I mean, I think I've said this before monitoring sounds kind of negative and like policing, but just, um, you know, checking in and also educating the owners on the historic char character of the building. So when I met with the people, um, I, I mean, I met with the North Amherst, uh, the Amherst Zion Church, um, because they let me study their building for my classroom work. And, and one of the things that the, the pastor mentioned was how they, they, they would have, they would like to have a central aisle and that would mean disrupting the historic pews that are in there. And, you know, that's just sort of a, um, you know, I just feel like those conversations would be so helpful to help people steward these buildings along, you know, after they've received money from us, even if you, even if you didn't have an internal restriction to just, you know, help educate people about why maybe a central aisle would be a bad idea. You know? um, but um, yeah, so that, that's, that's my one comment. Anybody yeah, I else? That, I mean, I will say that for instance, the Ithmar Conkey house, you know, standalone place, yep. they were allocated CPA funding. And I think their board is still discussing whether or not they would will accept the CPA funds because the restriction is a permanent one and it would cover the entire property. And I try to make the case that maybe we could have a, you know, a, a preservation area <laughs> that's not the property. And again, um, you know, because when it was inventoried and when it's significant, it did include the condominiums or the other property, but, you know, Mass Historic doesn't seem to be willing. And so, you know, we get into this situation where you know, uh, in theory, everyone says, oh, we'll accept a restriction. But once they get into it and they look at it, it becomes actually an obstacle. Um, you know, some of the legal requirements and just how it has to go through approval. I'm not right. saying a local restriction is a pushover, but, you know, it can be a seven page document that has, you know, requirements for, for maintenance, for upkeep, for insurance, for keeping it open to the public, for seeking commission review if there's changes. It gets recorded at the registry, so it runs with the property for the time it's in effect. And you know, so if any changes do happen, there is recourse, or you know, hopefully we keep a dialogue open. So the Unitarians right. and the other churches that have a restriction will notify the town. I mean, the UU does a great job. They'll send me a few times a year. You know, here's what we've been doing. You know, we have it open. We have a viewing. We have interpretation for the mural, and it's. I think it's worked really well. And so I feel like a local restriction is is sufficient. I just, you know. 
it's different than um, open space or housing where it always seems to be permanent. Uh, housing isn't actually now, but I think it's just a Amherst tradition using CPA funds is always permanent. And so it's a, it's a break from that. And I think that's where it might need some education with the CPA committee as well. Thank you. Anybody, any other comments? Okay. A national register nomination. Yeah, that was there. I've, I've been talking to Shannon, you know, remember she mentioned that mass historic with these older inventory forms, <laughs> they want all of them updated. Mm -hmm. Right, right. It's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> um, so I, I get it. I get it because they would like to have things in a newer digital format. You know, and the ones we have are scanned. And they're not, they can't even be, you know, OCR. So you can't even do character recognition. It's just a scanned image. And so you, you really, it, you know, it's really hard to do any keyword searching or research using those documents. Well, there's um, very little information on them too. There is. And so, um, yeah, we said, let's move forward. So I was looking at, we have some pots of money and I, I, I need to just kind of pick it up with Shannon, but she said, sure, you know, our contract with her is pretty much over. Um, and so we were just, Kind of going back and forth a little bit, but you okay. know, we had, the commission already said let's try to finish up what started, and so I think that's what we can do. Okay. Yeah, I I, I asked Mass Historic, I Shannon again, can we really negotiate with Mass Historic? And I was reaching out, and they they really aren't. <laughs> They're not budging. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I know, and I'm writing those things now, so. <laughs> <laughs> I know how many hours goes into they're really fun, but they really take a lot. I mean, yeah, they take a lot of time. Um, okay, so um barn tours, we talked about trying to get something going for September, and I will admit I have not um I have not made any progress on that. Glad that it's on the agenda to remind me to. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't think anybody else has any comment on that. So um, yeah, I'll try to have something together for our meeting in March. Um, that brings us to public comment. Looks like we still have three members of the public uh, in our audience. So if anyone from the public would like to make a public comment at this time, uh, you may raise your hand in order to do so. Okay, I don't see any hands raised. So that brings us to unanticipated items. Does anyone have any unanticipated items? No? Nope. Okay, um, then that brings us to our next meeting date. Um, so we have the February 27th meeting, that's for the um, demolition delay hearing, but uh, March, do we have a tentative date? I'm not sure we do, but maybe we could, you know, we could talk about what works for, for everyone. Yep, um, I'm not available until the week of the 13th. And that's true for me also. Okay. How, is Wednesday night any good for people? That the 15th? The 15th, 15th looks fine for me. I actually have a, another night meeting that night. Okay. Do you regularly have Wednesday nights conflict, Nate? Is that? Uh, the first and third are planning board evenings. And so that's usually. Oh, okay. All right. About Monday. Does that work for folks? The 13th? The I don't the know, 13th. Just Monday night, but yeah, the 13th. Yeah, the thirteenth works for me. Yep, it works okay. better. Okay, so our next meeting will be Monday, the thirteenth of March at six thirty p.m. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Do we? Oh, we have to uh, formally adjourn. Yeah, adjourn, yeah. Right? I think. Uh, yeah, I think I get to just call it. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, adjourning the meeting at 8 13 p.m thanks everybody anything else thanks, everyone okay we're good. thank you good night everyone good night, good night. Bye.